All right, chapter four. This is exercise metabolism. We're going to go a little bit into not only metabolism, but a little bit about oxygen uptake as well. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started with it. So rest to exercise transitions. As soon as we start exercising, as soon as we start doing any type of physical activity, it doesn't have to be any structured type of exercise, there's going to be an immediate demand for an increase in ATP. We're going to need that ATP for use for contracting the muscles and doing all the uh, physiological things that our bodies need to do to exercise, to keep up with a certain amount of intensity. Also with that ATP, we're going to have an oxygen uptake that is going to increase as well. So our breathing is going to get more rapid. It's going to get deeper also. So it will tend to reach a steady state. And a steady state is basically there's no significant increases or decreases. The, the body is trying to get to a homeostasis with all of the different parameters uh, that's going to be going on. Now we're going to have a, uh, an increase. And as long as we don't increase the intensity or even decrease the intensity, we're going to reach a steady state at some point. That's why if you're trying to take heart rate, maybe during a certain stages of, of, a, of an exercise protocol, you don't want to take heart rate or blood pressure at the first minute or even two minutes of that stage. You want to wait until about three to four minutes because at that point you should have reached a steady state. Now, also with this, the longer the exercise is, obviously the ATP is going to be needed for uh, or going to be generated through the aerobic system or the oxida oxidative system. Now, initially, though, the oxygen is not going to be enough to allow a lot of ATP generation within the oxidative system. So much of that ATP is going to be coming from the anaerobic pathways. And we've seen that in Chapter 3 with... Uh, the two anaerobic pathways, the ATP PCR, as well as anaerobic glycolysis or the glycolytic system. So we're going to end up with an O2 deficit, an oxygen deficit to where there's kind of a lag at the beginning of the exercise to where the demand for oxygen isn't high enough until we reach that steady state exercise, then the oxygen demand We'll get there. And then if we have any other increase past that of intensity of the exercise, then we're going to need to increase the oxygen intake as well. So these three figures from the book, if you look at the first or the top figure, it's looking at the speed that you're running at. This could be running, uh, could be cycling, whatever. I, I believe in the book it is uh, running. So we went from zero to seven meters per minute. And we look at time on the x-axis. So zero through five minutes. As you can see, immediately we went right up from zero to seven meters per minute through the entire exercise. And we maintained that seven meters per minute throughout the entire exercise. Now the use of ATP is going to increase up to where it needs to be at the very start of the exercise until the very end of the exercise until we are actually done. But if you look at the bottom chart or figure, you can see uh, oxygen was lagging behind. So at the beginning of exercise, we did start to increase the oxygen uptake. Our breathing got a little bit heavier. Uh, blood also started being pumped a little bit faster as well, carrying that oxygen around but it wasn't able to meet the demand. If you can see the, the purple dotted line, that is the actual demand. The green line is representing what is actually happening, how much oxygen we're actually bringing into our bodies and using for ATP or creating ATP. So this space between the green and the purple is known as oxygen deficit. Now, after a few minutes, you end up reaching that demand for oxygen, and that is known as steady state. Then we can maintain that as long as our speed is maintained, our, our intensity is maintained, then we will be able to meet the oxygen demands for that activity. Now, if we have an increase in the uh, speed or the intensity, so say instead of seven, 
meters per minute. We went up to maybe eight meters per minute. Well, this uh, line, this steady state is going to end up having to increase just a little bit more. The oxygen intake is going to have to increase just a little bit more. So you end up having a slight oxygen deficit as well during that next stage because it is a greater intensity. But then eventually after three or four minutes, we should reach a steady state and we should be able to meet the oxygen demands necessary for that activity. So looking at someone who is trained versus untrained. So uh, someone who has gone through some type of training process, they possess a lower oxygen deficit. They're able to meet those oxygen demands a little bit earlier on than someone who is not trained. Their bodies are just more adept to it. And in fact, it's the aerobic bioenergetic capacity is what it's referred to sometimes. The CV, the cardiovascular system, is working much better than someone who is untrained. Also, one of the adaptations to training, proper aerobic training, is you gain more mitochondria. And again, I, I described before that mitochondria is the powerhouse, powerhouse of the cell. And within that mitochondria, you have certain enzymes that are dedicated for aerobic metabolism. So you end up not only just increasing the mitochondria, but the enzymes that are associated with that uh, with those mitochondria, thus you're able to use the oxygen much more efficiently. There's other things too where you're going to end up gaining, uh, you know, your heart's going to function uh, more, and that goes back to the cardiovascular system, as well as uh, you're going to gain a little bit more pathway to actually pump that blood through the system. You're going to gain more capillaries. So there's more space for the blood to actually get to around the muscle and if you, uh, if you look at a uh, capillary, it's basically a one cell thick uh, structure, um, uh, blood vessel, and there's going to be a lot of gas exchange that's going to be able to occur now because there's a lot of cross-sectional area for gas to exchange across, all right, and we're talking about oxygen here, across that, uh, that one cell layer thick blood vessel. Also, there's going to be less production of lactate and hydrogen ions that are associated with that. And in fact, they're, they're able to buffer them out quicker as well. So there's going to be a longer time to someone actually fatiguing. So their, their onset of fatigue is uh, much greater than someone who is untrained. As well as the lactate threshold is increased. We'll see a, a diagram here uh, in a second of the uh, lactate threshold. Now, oxygen deficit and debt. We look at the differences between heavy exhaustive exercise and moderate types of exercise. All right, in a heavy exhaustive exercise, uh, essentially sprinting, I mean, you're really exercising at a very high intensity here you're really not necessarily able to meet the demands, the requirement of oxygen that you need for that exercise. All right, now you're going to get close to it. You're going to end up reaching a steady state, all right, but that's basically going to be your peak uh, VO2 that you're going to be able to get to. All right, so you have this huge oxygen deficit throughout the entire exercise. All right, and that is why we cannot sprint a marathon. If we extended this line out to, say, an hour, there'd be no possible way of ever reaching that oxygen demand. All right, so we need to reach, for the exercise such as a marathon, we need to get to a point where our bodies are able to meet the demand for the oxygen that's necessary to continue that intensity for, you know, mile after mile after mile. Now, if we look at moderate exercise, eventually we're going to reach that oxygen demand, that requirement uh, that our bodies have uh, to get the oxygen in, and we're able to use it through the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain and generate some ATP. Now, a couple of things about uh, these figures as well, as you'll notice after the exercise, we also have a shaded blue portion. All right, this is kind of 
opposite of what's happening at the start of exercise. At the start of exercise, we don't have enough oxygen coming into our system and being able to de- uh, meet those demands. At the end of exercise, you ex- uh, you end up having too much. And this is why we breathe heavily after we've stopped exercising. It, if you think about it, in theory, you should almost, as soon as you stop the exercise, say you go for a sprint, you sprint 100 yards, you don't need that oxygen anymore to meet that demand because you haven't, you're not exercising anymore. So you should just stop basically breathing heavy like you were during that exercise. But that's not necessarily the case because there's other things that are going on there. So we end up having this excess oxygen and it's, this is referred to as excess post-exercise oxygen consumption or EPOC. All right. And there's a rapid and a slow portion with this. And you don't necessarily have to, uh, memorize exactly what the rapid and slow portion are, but uh, to give you an idea of what's actually going on in general through this excess post-exercise oxygen consumption is that uh, the phosphocreatine needs some oxygen to resynthesize. Also, you're replenishing some of the oxygen stores. Again, we don't have a lot of oxygen stores, but we still need to replenish what we have lost. Now then during the slow portion Uh, we're going to have an elevated heart rate and respiratory rate as well. And with that, the heart needs oxygen to work as well as the muscles that help you breathe. So those muscles are demanding a little bit of extra oxygen to keep them going, basically. Also, our core temperature is increased and that just naturally increases our metabolic rate. And lactic acid and converting that into glucose requires some oxygen. So these are some of the reasons why after exercise, we are uh, we have excess oxygen and we're breathing heavy right after exercise. Even though we're not exercising anymore, we still need it to basically replenish the body of uh, a bunch of things and get things back to what they were pre-exercise. All right, so just uh, looking at this figure blown up a, a little bit more, this is during the heavy exhaustive exercise Again, this is the oxygen requirement for this exercise and the actual oxygen that we're intaking to our uh, breathing into our bodies is going to be this blue line, All right? So we have this huge oxygen deficit. The difference between the oxygen that we're actually bringing in versus what we need to meet the demand of this exercise. Then after exercise, the demand for the oxygen or the requirement that is needed, again, is not there. Uh, We don't necessarily need it for the exercise anymore. But after exercise, there is this excess post-exercise oxygen consumption to allow for replenishment of the uh, phosphocreatine, of the oxygen stores, as well as uh, buffering out lactate, converting it back into glucose, and, and so on and so forth. All right, and this is also another figure from the book that kind of outlines it as well, uh, more of a pictorial description of what's going on after exercise and why we have uh, EPOC. So the resynthesis of uh, phosphocreatine, lactate conversion, the restoration of muscle and blood oxygen stores, the elevated body temperature, again, is going to increase the metabolic demand itself. And the heart rate and breathing and the muscles that are associated with uh, those processes also need that oxygen. Uh, And there's also going to be some hormones that are going to affect this as well. Uh, Namely, um, the catecholamines is what what they're referred to as epinephrine or epinephrine. But we're not going to get into those uh, too detailed, at least as of yet. All right, lactic acid. So discuss this before. Uh, but let's go a little bit more uh, detail into it. So 70% of it is, is oxidized and used as a substrate by the heart and the skeletal muscle. So again, it, it is actually used as fuel. Uh, another portion of it is converted into glucose. And another 10% of it then is converted into amino acids. And again, these are average numbers. Now, if you look uh, in in the book, there's going to be a figure in this chapter that uh, that 
looks like this. And it's basically describing how some type of light exercise, like an active recovery after the exercise is more beneficial of removing the lactate than just stopping the exercise. And in fact, if you look at uh, this figure, the, the red represents no exercise after a heavy, intense exercise and the green line represents a light exercise. And it's referring to the blood lactate concentration within the, uh, within the body. Now, as you can see, the uh, blood lactate decreases significantly more and more rapidly during that recovery after exercise when you have some type of a light exercise, maybe a walk or maybe a light jog, right? It doesn't have to be a very intense exercise. That's not, not the, the whole goal, uh, but that's more beneficial than just stopping and not performing any type of exercise. All right, so let's look at incremental exercise. And this is where we're going to get into the concept of VO2 max, or the maximal volume of oxygen that you're able to consume and utilize uh, based on a number of different uh, things here. So the oxygen uptake increases linearly. All right, so as you increase intensity, it's going to increase in proportion to that increase in, in intensity until you reach your max. Now, you know when, a, uh, when someone reaches their full potential, their VO2 max, when you have increased the intensity, such as uh, this case here, we're looking at wattages. We went from 250 to 300, so we increased the intensity of the exercise, but the volume of oxygen that was consumed did not increase, and that's when you know you've reached a true max. So you've increased the intensity, but the VO2 has not increased. So VO2 max is a physiological ceiling for O2 delivery. It is affected by genetics, and actually genetics is the big factor. The, 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 uh, the genes that you possess, uh, and we're talking about uh, uh, DNA, we're not, we're not talking about blue genes, <laughs> Or whatnot, but the genes that you you possess uh, within your body, they're going to determine what your ceiling is. All right, they're going to determine what your maximal VO2 you could possibly reach. All right, now you're not going to know how, what what that ceiling is, how high you can actually get the and uh, the volume of oxygen that you consume in the max of that volume until you start training and training and training. All right, some people may never know what their VO2 max could be, All right? So genetics plays a huge role of determining what you could do, but training is going to determine what you can do. All right, so it's just kind of up to you to get to that point. Now, the cardiorespiratory system, or CR, uh, its ability to actually deliver the oxygen uh, to the tissues that are working, in this case, we're looking at the, at the muscles that are contracting. The cardiorespiratory system is very, very important. The heart has to be functioning properly, as well as the lungs. If there's any type of condition or disease uh, within any of those systems, there's gonna uh, there's gonna be some um, some problems down the line. Then where the VO2 max is gonna decrease. Also, the ability for muscles to use the oxygen and actually produce the ATP aerobically. And you might guess that uh, a lot of this has to do with the mitochondria. Yes, it does. And this would be the mitochondria as well as the enzymes that are used in the aerobic system. All right, so lactate threshold. I've touched on it a little bit, so let's, uh, let's get into it so you can actually see and we can discuss exactly what it is. Well, I guess I'm, I'm discussing it, so I'm kind of talking, <laughs> but anyway, I got to have fun with these. Got to make a little joke every once in a while. All right. So anyway, uh, there's going to be a sudden rise in blood lactate. We've seen that, uh, uh, before I, I, I've described it before. It's also known as onset of blood lactate accumulation or OBLA, O-B-L-A. It's also sometimes 
uh, referred to as anaerobic threshold. So you got three different terms for basically the same thing, lactate threshold, onset of blood lactate accumulation, and anaerobic threshold. So there's actually this shift that's going towards anaerobic glycolysis. And if you refer back to chapter three, we talked about that, where um, anaerobic glycolysis, that last step is pyruvate going into lactate. So you're going to be creating a lot of lactate with that. So the more intense the exercise is in the uh, the more you're going to end up using some of the anaerobic glycolysis to produce the ATP and the more lactate that you are going to be producing. Now, this lactate threshold is uh, usually expressed as a percentage of your VO2. So what that means is uh, you're going to reach your lactate threshold at, say, 75% of your VO2 max, or some people it might be 85 or it might be you know, 84, you know, whatever it may be, it's usually expressed as a percentage of your VO2 max. The closer that percentage gets to a hundred percent, it may never, it's, it's never going to get to a hundred percent, but the closer it gets to a hundred percent, the better it is. Cause that means you're going to be able to work at a higher intensity at a higher VO2 max for a longer period of time without fatiguing. All right, so that's very beneficial for times when you're trying to perform at a high intensity and maybe trying to, to win a race like a marathon or a 5K or a long distance cycling or, or maybe long uh, distance rowing, whatever it may be. And in fact, the lactate threshold is actually the best indicator for endurance performance. All right, it's the best predictor for it. Right. Your VO2 max is a good predictor. It's a, it's a really good predictor of your aerobic conditioning and how fit you are. But it is not the greatest predictor of how well you can do in a certain long-distance event. And that is going to be where the lactate threshold comes in. And that's in the, again, the lactate threshold is a better predictor of that than VO2 max itself. Now, if you only have a VO2 max of say 30, which is really low in, um, basically 18 to 30 year olds, but you might have a high lactate threshold, maybe 75 or 80 You're That's still probably going to be uh, bad. You still need to have both of them getting up there above average. All right. But if you take two people have the same VO2 max and one has a lactate threshold of 75 and one has a lactate threshold of 50, that one who has lactate threshold of 75 is going to perform much better, all right? All things being equal. All right, so this is a figure of what we're actually discussing here. So as you're increasing your intensity, right? So you're getting up into the percentages of your VO2 max. You go to 20, there's 30, 40, 50, and you get to around 60%. Again, this is just an average. This isn't... Um, you know, set in stone or anything like that. Again, this is just a uh, depiction. So you're steadily increasing lactate, but it's not increasing so much to where it's going to affect you all that much. And your body should be able to buffer it out. If you're going to reach a point, and in this case, it was 60 VO2 of uh, what uh, VO2 max, 60% VO2 max. And there's this sharp, very sharp incline in the lactate concentration. And this point is known as lactate threshold. So this, in this case, lactate threshold is 60%. All right, so the blood lactate accumulation increases significantly compared to what the clearance rate is. So the body isn't able to clear it out. All right, so some possible reasons for this lactate increase. Uh, there's going to be low muscle oxygen. If you don't have enough oxygen, you're going to go more towards the anaerobic type of uh, pathway, uh, anaerobic glycolysis. So you have an accelerated glycolysis. And that NADH, uh, there's going to be uh, some NADH that's going to be produced through glycolysis. And since you don't have oxygen, you're not going to be able to go through the citric acid cycle to get the NADH and, and the FADH2 and transport those ions to the electron transport chain, All right? Far back to chapter three with that. You're not going to be able to produce those, uh, the, the NADH fast enough 
to actually get it into the electron transport chain. Also, you're going to have recruitment of fast twitch muscle fibers. Again, fast twitch muscle fibers, these are the type 2 muscle fibers, and they're more anaerobic. They have more anaerobic type properties. There's not a, a, as great of uh, mitochondria uh, located within them. And uh, with that, there's not going to be as many oxidative enzymes, so they're not going to be able to use the oxygen um, efficiently enough. So that lactate dehydrogenase, if you go back to, you can refer back to the, uh, through glycolysis, that last step, it goes from pyruvate to lacta uh, lactate. Uh, that enzyme is known as lactate dehydrogenase. And in a type 2 muscle fiber, the, uh, the isozyme, uh, the form of LDH that is in type 2 muscle fibers, promotes the formation of lactic acid. So therefore, there's a rise in lactate production. Plus, there's also a decrease in the removal because the body's just not, not able to take care of it as efficiently and quickly enough. All right, I kind of touched on this, uh, but I, I do want to get into it. We'll get into more detail uh, with this later on when we get into muscle damage and uh, repair as well as uh, some types of, of training. But lactic acid is again has gotten a bad rap. It can again it can be used as fuel, and it can be used to create more glucose. It does not cause soreness, All right? It can cause fatigue, or it uh, it is indirectly the cause of fatigue. Again, it's the hydrogen ions that decrease the pH that causes the fatigue. But lactic acid does not cause soreness. All right, uh, there, there's a misconception that after you work out, you know, really really hard. Uh, you're really sore, you know, people will say, especially in the day or so after your, uh, that exercise, you're sore. Well, you had lactic acid build up and you're just getting rid of that. No, that is not the case. That's, uh, doesn't even make any sense when you, <laughs> when you really look at it because lactic acid is always created. It's always being buffered out, All right? That soreness or uh, what's known as delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS, that is actually, uh, due to the structural damage that's occurring while you're exercising. So it has really nothing to do with lactic acid. Lactate uh, removal is pretty rapid, and it, and it returns to uh, baseline about an hour after exercise anyway. So again, that soreness is caused by muscle damage. All right, so looking at the fuels that we use during exercise... So there's a shift from carbohydrate to fat uh, during prolonged exercise. So at the beginning of exercise, we can see that carbohydrates, car carbohydrates are in the blue, and in the green is fats. And we have exercise time down here. So we're looking at a 100-minute exercise. So the percentage of carbohydrates at the beginning versus the percentage of fats, it's about 50-50 for the most part. And the carbohydrates start to decrease. We start to rely less on those as we continue the exercise. And we increase the amount of fat. Now, there's some um, reasons for that. And one of the main reasons is that we're starting to use up the carbohydrates. So we're starting to use more and more fat because we're running out of carbohydrates at a certain point in time. And uh, there is a certain point where we're going to run out of the actual carbohydrates, the glycogen that we have stored, and we're going to have to rely pretty much all on fat. Now, the intensity of the exercise is also going to determine what we're going to, or what the fuel source is going to be. All right, so if we, if we look at a, a very uh, low intensity exercise, 25% of our VO2, all right, triglycerides, muscle triglycerides, the uh, the stored fat within the muscles, going to be fairly low. Now, if you look at the free fatty acids, that's pretty high. All right, so a very low intensity exercise is going to require or is going to use more fats than is carbohydrates. All right, and we can see glucose right here is going to be very low as well. And the same thing with muscle glycogen. 
Now we bump that intensity up. If we take this glycogen and going from 25% to 65%, even 65% to 85%. So really increasing the intensity, we're going to be relying much more on glycogen. So during high intensity exercise, we're going to rely on glucose and glycogen more than fat. If it's a long extended exercise, the, the intensity is going to be fairly low. So we're going to be relying more on fats. All right. So you can see what's, what's also happening with the plasma glucose. Glucose is pretty much even throughout. Uh, and then the plasma fatty acids, as we increase the intensity, are going to decrease as well as the... Um, uh, the triglycerides within the muscle. Now we do have a slight increase in, in the triglyceride use once we bump up the intensity as well. Again, this 65% is kind of in the middle. All right. I mean, it's a fairly good, uh, uh, it's a moderate intensity. It's not necessarily high intensity. It's not low intensity, but again, during very low intensity exercise, it's going to be more fats and this is going to include those long uh, duration activities, long runs. During a very high intensity exercise, 85, 90, 95%, we're going to rely pretty heavily on glycogen and glucose. Now, the effect of exercise duration on muscle fuel source. Right, so if we extend that exercise out, and we're looking at hours here now, one, two, three, and four hours of continuous exercise. And if we look at the percentage of energy expenditure coming from four different sources, either muscle triglycerides, plasma, fatty acids, so the fatty acids that are basically floating around in our blood, and blood glucose, as well as muscle glycogen. Now, one thing you'll notice is the muscle glycogen gradually decreases. And this is because we are going to end up using it up, all right, at three to four hours it's probably going to be gone is if we're not including more of it into our uh, more glucose into our system, it's going to be gone. Now this blood glucose, we're going to start to rely a little bit more on the blood glucose. And some of this blood glucose is actually going to be coming from uh, possibly some fats uh, could be coming from some uh, lactate that was converted into glucose. It could also be uh, from uh, external uh, sources, but in this case, this is uh, this figure I believe is not showing any type of exogenous uh, type of intake, such as maybe a sports drink or, or or whatnot. But it's also coming from liver glycogen as well. So again, the longer the duration, and if you can see, if you add in the muscle triglycerides as well as the plasma fatty acids. Uh, we're going to start to increase, rely more so on those fatty acids, right? Now, less on the muscle triglycerides because we're going to start using those up as as well. And we're going to start breaking down fat stores in the adipocytes and bring those to the muscle and get those in there and use them for exercise. So again, just another depiction of showing that at the beginning of exercise, we're going to rely a little bit more on carbohydrates if we extend that exercise to a long period of exercise, one and a half to four hours or even, or even longer, we're going to start relying more so on fatty acids. If we increase the intensity of the exercise, we're going to start relying more on carbohydrates. If it's a very low intensity exercise, such as this case, uh, this was probably a fairly low to moderate type of exercise. It's going to be more, uh, more fatty acids than carbohydrates. All right, so that was chapter four, exercise metabolism. All right, so we talked a little bit about some of the oxygen that was uh, being brought in and how we're using that at the beginning of the exercise and at the end of exercise, and why we're breathing so heavy after we exercise, some lactate, uh, lactic acid stuff. Uh, also looked at some fuel sources during exercise as well. So if you have any comments, have any questions, you can email me. You can also comment in the comment section below. So let me know what you think if you have any questions. And I thank you for watching and uh, I'll see you or I guess you'll hear me in the next chapter.